So before I go ahead and get started, how many of you folks here are actually uh, using microservices production? Ooh, a couple. Uh, how many of you are considering it? Cool, cool. Uh, anyone here uh, familiar with F Sharp? <laughs> Much fewer. Okay, okay. Uh, there's a fair amount of F Sharp in this talk as well, but I will go over all the pieces that you guys will need. So. Today is patterns and practices for real-world event-driven microservices. Sometimes I throw a cloud-based in there. There's a few other you know, good buzzwords that I, I like to fill this title up with uh, just to make it extra fun. But to start off, I'll usually actually define all of these pieces. So for real-world, I mean I work at Jet.com. We are a shopping site. We are competing with Amazon.com in the States. Uh, we aren't available even, we're only available even in 48 states. We're not available in Alaska and Hawaii yet. But we have over 25,000 orders per day, 10.5 million items on the site. Uh, we are the number four marketplace worldwide. We're behind Amazon, I believe Walmart, and maybe um, the other big one, I forget. Uh, but we're number four uh, for marketplace. And 700 microservices. I usually say 700, but that's a bit of a made-up number. The <laughs> last year around this time, I, I was pretty comfortable in saying we had about 300. And you know, as time went on, I'd, I'd ping the different teams, the different developers, and say, well, you know, how many do you think we have now? Are we maybe up to 400, or are we at 450? At some point, everyone's like, we don't know. My team has 22. My team has 47. My team has eight. And so I just sort of, you know, did average the numbers over all the teams and figured it's probably somewhere between 400 and 1,000 microservices. And 700 seems like a nice round number. So we have a lot of microservices. And uh, the, the code definitely for all of our microservices and the vast majority of our code in general is F Sharp. It's maybe 90, 95% of all of our code. We do use a lot of technologies. Uh, the, we are very heavy users. You'll see the, the top section of Azure. And if you recall from the last slide, we are taking on Amazon. So we are not heavy users of AWS. Uh, but we use you know, their websites, Active Directory, the, the service bus topics, the blob storage. We use yeah, a lot of what Azure has to offer. The F Sharp section in the middle in green, uh, again, the vast majority of our code is in F Sharp. So Packet and Fake, we use a lot of, if you haven't looked at Packet and Fake, Packet is a uh, package manager which sits on top of NuGet and is absolutely wonderful. Fake is a build system, also fabulous and at, again, absolutely wonderful. Uh, but F -sharp .data, FS Blog, uh, SQL Provider, uh, F -sharp Async. I know the SQL Provider and F -sharp Async, we actually have folks on staff who contribute very regularly, are the maintainers of both of those. So we. Again, we do a lot in the, the F-sharp space. R and Python for our, our data science, Node and Angular on our front end. And then the bottom section of purple is sort of everything else. Uh, we use Go very heavily. We have Console and Kafka, again, microservices, Xamarin, SQL, you know, Apache Hive and Tez. We're very much a right tool for the job company, and we use whatever makes sense. So. <sighs> microservices, you know, that's, that is our real world. We are, you know, very much using all of these things in production. It is a, a very large site. We do need to handle these things at scale. So microservices, I found as I started speaking about microservices that I really needed to define what a microservice is, what that means to us at JET. And for us, for the, the definition, it's an application of the single responsibility principle at the service level. So if you don't know what that means, a class should have one and only one reason to change. To us, a microservice isn't uh, any one of these other, you know, it's not just one function. It's not, you know, the amount of code that a two pizza team can write in just a week and a half. You know, it's none of those other metrics. It's just simply the, the microservice itself should, the microservice itself should have one reason to exist, one, one purpose. The benefits of using microservices, very, very easy scalability. When you have such a small piece of code, you can obviously scale that up and out very, very quickly. If you 
for independent releasability, again, a very small piece of code, it's very easy to release just a single piece, just that one piece of code. It's not going to affect nearly as many pieces. You don't have to as run, run as many checks and tests and ver verifications and, and all of this before you release, though you do need to run those, the, those checks and verifications. But it is a lot easier to work with a small piece of code. There's also a more even distribution of complexity, and that, excuse me, that really means that it, we're shifting the, the, the complexity from the business logic to the infrastructure. Working with microservices, as the few of you who are know this, is, it's very, you know, it's very difficult to do. It, there's a lot of infrastructure, there's a lot of, you know, infrastructure that you need around those services. You need to uh, handle discoverability. You need to restart them at, at, at will. And there's a, a, a lot of things that you need there that, that really uh, come into play. And it, that ends up being a lot heavier. It still, I think, is a lot more, uh, a lot less difficult than handling a giant monolithic solution. One of those things where, you know, it's been, three years and 47 developers sort of all cross their fingers and over a week you progressively release, you know, the website. I've been involved in those and those are very difficult. <laughs> but having, having the infrastructure around microservices and using microservices is still a lot more simple than that. So cloud-based. Obviously, we use Azure, as I mentioned. Um, and if you're working with Azure, microservices are a very natural uh, natural choice, because it's very easy to, to loosely couple things and, you know, with the cloud and everything. But cloud-based does mean you, know, that you need to consider failures. Failures will be built into your system. There'll be times when the servers are down or your network is down. And for that, you really should have a chaos engineering program. It's one of the, it's, you know, if availability matters, then you should be testing for it. It's really a, a best practices sort of move. So this is my first uh, pattern for, for microservices. And what is chaos engineering? A lot of folks think it's just wreaking havoc with your code because it's fun and you can. And you know, really what could possibly go wrong if you decide to do that? Chaos engineering is really talking about controlled experiments. So small, small changes to test out what would happen uh, because there will be inevitable failures, you know, there will be failures in your system, the network will go down, there will, there will be lots and lots of issues that you can't control because you are using a cloud provider. And by doing those small tests and building confidence in your system, you start to, you know, you, you gain a few benefits. First, you're awake. If you're running a test that is bringing down a specific service or a specific server, the outages are going to happen when, the, when you know, we're all awake when we're ready to deal with a failure. You know, it's, it's 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning and you've had your coffee and you're, you're ready and awake. It's not 4 a.m. and you've just been paged and you have absolutely no idea what's going on and there's an error message and you have to wake up and understand everything and suddenly fix it. You're prepared. You can handle this. You know, it's, it's a lot easier at that, at that point. It, we found that folks also start to design for failure. So you know that these tests will happen if you're running a chaos engineering program, or, you know, I, and you start thinking about, well, you know, if this service, if the service actually goes down, how should we handle that? What should happen? What, what should that look like, you know, upstream and downstream, and, and where, where should we put in checks for all of that? So you start to think ahead and, and handle all these issues. You also, you end up having much healthier systems because you're dealing with these, uh, because you're pre-checking for this. Uh, so you end up having, you know, you're, you're preventing later outages by, by having a small, a small thing go wrong at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, you're preventing a much bigger disaster from happening at 4 a.m., you know, six weeks from now. There's also a, a fair amount of self-service. It's it's similar to the designing for failure, but once you start, once you start doing this, once you start checking for failures, once you start uh, really thinking about how these things are going to happen, you sort of want to. 
You, you want to know if, you know, you want your service to be the best one. So you start thinking not just in advance for designing for failure, but what is everything that can go wrong? Not just the, thing, the four things that I know we test for, but let's start getting creative. And what if uh, you know, an entire region in Azure, Azure goes down or something ridiculous? And what would happen then? And so you, you, we found some devs start getting really sort of competitive with themselves to make their services better and better. Uh, and so that's you know, chaos engineering, obviously, is, is my first recommendation. So jumping back now, uh, still definitions, event-driven. And event-driven just basically means the focus of your application code is reacting to actual events. It can be single events, it can be an entire stream of events. Uh, in our case, it is a stream, but it event-driven just means reacting. Events uh, are any, any significant change in state that's happened in your domain. It should be past tense. It should be immutable. The, you know, the, an event here, maybe all of you folks woke up this morning, you got dressed, you came to NDC Sydney, and you decided to come to my talk. Those things have happened. You can't change your decision. You can't pretend that you decided not to come to NDC Sydney or to my talk. You're all here. Like it, that's, that is immutable. It's, it's a fact. Uh, it's also, the last one, contains only relevant, you know, the actual event itself, only relevant data to the transaction. It doesn't matter what color shirt anyone is wearing here today. The important thing is, or the, the important information for this event is that you actually showed up, that you're in this room, that either you're at NDC Sydney or maybe you're at this hotel. But, you know, it, it doesn't matter you know, what color shirt you're wearing, what, what type of shoes. That's all irrelevant data to this actual, the actual transaction. And one confusing point, the term event tends to refer to both the actual event itself, you know, showing up at this talk, as well as the notification message that's passed around to the, the rest of the system. So as notification, as notification messages, the, excuse me, the, uh, we have a simple you know, push-based notification. We have an event emitter, and the events travel through an event channel and then are consumed by an event consumer. which is uh, very similar to uh, reactive. Does anyone here actually use any of the Rx extensions or? Uh, cool, a couple people. Uh, so the reactive manifesto, if I can recall, it was uh, modern applications should be responsive, message-driven, resilient, and elastic. Um, but basically, you know, event-driven is a very reactive concept. Events can be thought of as an observable, and when they are, you know, the, the microservice input of it, you know, when you're reading these events, you can, be, you can treat that stream of events as an observable and event source that. So does anyone here do event sourcing? Okay, a couple people. Have the rest of you folks heard of event sourcing? A couple folks, okay. So event sourcing, slightly different than, or definitely different than event driven. It's more about how you're modeling a domain. It's, it's a, an append-only sequence of events. Uh, you really just keep track of each of the events as they happen, so that you have you know, one giant stream of events. It keeps track of all of the state changes. A, excuse me. A very common uh, way of explaining this is you know, thinking about folks, uh, customers, when they move. You can have a, a standard database would only handle the most recent customer address, but an event log would, you would see all of the past events. You'd see when the customer moved, what the previous address had been, uh, and a flow of events through that. And you can end up replaying those streams. Uh, so, you know, a, a relational model will only have the, the latest information. But you can end up replaying these streams very similar to an account history, a, a ledger, a bank statement sort of idea where you can go back, you know, if you, if you are one of those people who, who, you know, keeps every single statement that you've ever had, I used to be one of those people, I am not that person anymore, um, but you can go back through all of your statements and, you know, since the beginning of time from your, you know, when you started the bank account and see exactly what happened and make sure that, you know, your, 
version of the information is in sync with what the bank's version of the information is. But for example, maybe the date here, uh, maybe there's, there's additional uh, information you wanted to capture the time as well. You know, if you think of all of this as just one giant stream of events, you can replay all of that information and you know, add on the time assuming that that was captured to begin with and just cut off. Uh, so you can you know, replay and adjust if you, if you go through all of this, say you, you found a bug in the way this was handled, if you, you know, needed to update the SQL schema uh, of the, the tables that this information was writing to, maybe you needed to re-index your searching, but there's lots of different reasons and ways that you might uh, want to rerun this event stream. So how did JET actually decide on microservices? And this is actually one of my favorite stories. We didn't. We decided on F sharp. We sort of, and I will tell that story soon, actually next. But once we had decided on F sharp, we decided, you know, we, uh, F sharp being a functional language and you know, being immutable de by default, most, well, the vast majority of functions that you're writing in F sharp are proper functions. They have inputs and they have proper outputs. And the microservices to us are just one large script. So they act sort of like one big function. There's some uh, specific inputs, there's specific outputs, they should be immutable in general. And we, we also named things, you know, if you're writing a bunch of microservices, you don't want to name thing, you know, have maybe, you know, an, an import new items. So we have an, an import SKU service. The proper naming conventions dictate that you'd want to have, have that called import SKUs, not import SKU service. And we were doing that because we weren't thinking of anything as services. We were just thinking, well, this is the import SKU script and this should be importing SKUs. And it, you know, it has a few inputs of, you know, places to look, a, a stream to follow. And, you know, specific outputs of, you know, the, the SKUs themselves, perhaps. But there was no actual meeting where everyone sat down and said, as a good architectural decision, let's do microservices. We built a bunch of F-sharp scripts and accidentally woke up one day and had microservices. So, then why did we choose F-sharp? Well, the, the CTO attended a conference ages ago. Um, well, so first of all, this, this CTO is a big uh, Microsoft person, had always worked with, with C-sharp, was very comfortable there. And so the original plan was, was to just use C-sharp. And he attended a, a conference years and years ago, when, when F-sharp was fairly new, maybe 2012, and heard the same story that a lot of folks have heard about how F-sharp is good for math and science and you know, you should, a lot of the banks use it for financial purposes, and, you know, that, that's sort of F-sharp's sweet spot. And he decided that, you know, as part of the, one of JET's big uh, things is that we have a very interesting pricing engine. It can, it, it double checks which merchants you're going to be purchasing from, and if you're buying two or three things from the same merchant, it will... Uh, bundle those together, you can save a little bit on shipping, uh, or the merchant can save a little bit on shipping, and we pass those savings on to you. But we don't, you know, we don't really know who you're going to, we don't know which merchants you're going to be purchasing from until we have the final basket, because at that point, then we do all of that matching and see, see if we can get four things from one merchant and two from another, as compared to, you know, four individual items and two from a single merchant. So that pricing engine, the, the CTO realized, is a really is, is a perfect fit for F sharp. That seems like a natural. There's there's going to be a lot of mathy things there, and so some of the very early developers, the first you know two or three, were F sharp developers. Uh, well, of the first two or three developers, four developers, there was a an F sharp developer to work on the pricing engine. And as you know, the, the architectural discussions started to happen and as things you know, moved along, they started to have more and more discussions about, well, should we maybe be using F-sharp for this piece over here? What about this part over here? There, where, where does it really fit? Should, it, should the process be expanded or not? And they started to realize that 
they, they weren't really sure. And as a very, very young startup, they were like, hmm, we have time, and let's just, let's, let's see where this goes. We'll build one complete solution in C Sharp and one complete solution in F Sharp and see which one is better. So F Sharp obviously won, but it was the, so the, there were several factors. A lot of them are the, the same things that you hear about F Sharp. The, there's you know, less code leading to fewer bugs, and you're able to, to keep a lot of that in your head, and, and all of these, these good things that people do hear about, uh, do say legitimately about F Sharp. Um, uh, the type system is really wonderful. It double checks things for you. But the big thing, the sort of the straw that broke the camel's back, was our, our cross-cutting concerns library. We, you know, as one does, you know, we needed something to handle validation and logging and then all of those things. And the standard way of handling that in uh, Web API and a few other libraries is by using attributes. You inject an extra function call before, before, your, before your functions. Um, and I know that, that several frameworks th do this, but we needed a way to handle these cross-cutting concerns for services that weren't always based on HTTP. And that was really difficult to do in a generic way. That wasn't something that, that C Sharp really handled well at all. But with F Sharp, it ended up being just an extra, uh, for the folks who know F Sharp, um, just an extra uh, pipe statement. You're just making an extra function call and then continuing down the statement. So I will show you guys some F Sharp code in a minute. But the, the concept of piping is very similar to PowerShell or if you've done any Unix shell scripting. Uh, the, the output from the previous function is piped in as a parameter, the last parameter to the, the part after the function, or the, the pipe. And that being able to just add a separate step in that pipeline made it basically completely trivial to handle these concerns for us. And that was sort of the, the big reason we ended up switching. So a few reasons on why people chose F Sharp uh, in general. First, people love programming in functional, uh, people love functional programming. The, I don't know if you folks saw the, the recent, sort of recent at this point, um, I think it was April, uh, Stack Overflow survey. But Swift, F Sharp, Scala, Clojure, Haskell, are all you know, very high in the, the list. 70% of people just really love programming in that language. Or 70% of the responders said they loved it. That doesn't seem quite right. Not sure where those 70% are coming from. But it's awesome, people love it. Uh, so productivity. I know Jan is here, he actually spoke yesterday. But when he was working for a company called GameSys, I know they do uh, some Facebook games, I'm not sure exactly which ones, but obviously very, uh, very high numbers of users need to be very available. He discovered F Sharp, thought, this is really cool, I think it's going to solve some of my problems, and rewrote the entire back end of the project that he was working on at work. He was able to go from you know, concept into production in six weeks, and he replaced an entire team of nine Java developers. When I first heard his story, I thought it was like four or five, uh, but apparently it was nine, and it only took six weeks. But you know, he would, and he was able to maintain the entire back end of this now himself. So he is around if you guys want to talk to him about that. Uh, expanded feature set. There's a lot of really interesting features in F Sharp that really have made it useful both for microservices and for Jet in general to really you know, scale up so quickly. First, option types. Option types are a lot like nullables. They're, they're a lot more powerful. They, uh, first, it's, you, know, you, can, you can have an option type of anything, not just you know, ints or bools, or uh, you can have an option of a string, an option of a custom type, an option of an entire function. You can, uh, you can nest option types. You can have an option of an option of an option type. It's not always pretty, but you can do it. Uh, you can also, there's a, you can use mapping and iterating and, and other, other such functions over this. So if you have, you have an option type and you want to, um, maybe a, an array of options and you want to, to double check, uh, you, can, you can basically map the entire thing and, and keep the, 
the null ones null and the, the ones that exist exist. And then this joke comes from when you're using an option type to actually get to the value, you need, you're forced to handle that null check. So because you're forced to handle that null check, you're basically obviating null reference exceptions entirely. There's also a really, uh, one of the most useful features, especially in uh, bringing down, uh, you know, reducing code size, uh, discriminated unions. So on your right, uh, we have a, a discriminated union uh, transport type. If you think about, if you just think about car, bus, and bicycle, then you can think of a discriminated union as sort of an enum type. It works very similarly. When you add on the extra bit of information, the make and model and route, then it's a lot more like a, a simple object hierarchy. So we have the, the C sharp on the other, on this side there's a, a transport uh, a base class, you know, a car, bus, and bicycle each inherit from it. Obviously in C sharp this would take four separate files, the, but they do contain basically the exact same information. I say basically, the C sharp version still actually lacks structural equality. You'd have to override equality and comparison and get hash, like it'd be complicated to add in all of that every time. It's also not properly immutable. It's idiomatic, but it, uh, there's still a private set, so you could set it. Uh, the, the backing field technically probably should be read only. But the, the F sharp then has more happening in these four lines of code. It's also very, very, very easy to pattern match on. And pattern matching, I know that C sharp, I think seven was supposed to get some pattern matching. I know they've scaled that back. I don't know exactly where that stands. Uh, but the, without any pattern matching in C sharp, then the only way we can have, uh, the only matching that we could do in say a, a switch statement would be on the top on a constant, uh, whereas F sharp has all of these other ways of interacting with your data and handling, you know, just working with it to, to faster and easier get to the information that you actually need. So this is what that would actually look like. We have this get there via, uh, it takes in a transport, we'll match transport with, in the first case you have a car, which is a, you know, takes a specific make and a model. You have a bus, which takes a specific route, or a bicycle. If I, for example, add on a train, because trains are also a valid type of transportation, then we would, the next time, um, immediately if you're in the, in the same file, or every time you compile, you'll get a warning that you have incomplete pattern matched expressions. So rather than having this pop up again, you know, at 3 a.m. when you've suddenly been paged and the, you know, the pager duty alerts are going off like crazy, you just automatically know that you get a whole bunch of warnings when you compile. You can see those. You can see all the places that you're supposed to update that code. And the compiler just sort of has your back and is watching out for you. Type providers are also one of my absolute most favorite uh, features of F Sharp, and this is like I mentioned, we have one of the maintainers of the SQL provider that, that works at JET. Type providers are also a really, uh, they're just really wonderful. They, uh, the first, they're, they're what really sold me on F Sharp. It's, uh, and I, I post Julie's book not to make fun of Julie. There's a lot of very hard work that went into her book. And the 920 pages length, I think, is valid to make sure that any framework is actually running and doing what you want it to do. It takes a lot of effort to really make any framework do what you actually wanted it to do to begin with. But the, so 920 pages for Julie to, to explain how to, how to properly use entity framework. And then 31 lines here, we have uh, really lines 13 and 14 are connecting to a type provider and then grabbing the, the data context. So the, the first line really just does all of that connection for you. The, starting at line 16, we have a, a quick query. Starting at line 26, we're inserting information back into the database. And it's, it's almost trivial to use the type providers because it really is only one or two lines of setup each time. You have to you know, include a library and then connect out to it. 
Type providers also aren't just for SQL Server. You can have a JSON type provider, an XML type provider, a CSV type provider. There's an R type provider for folks who are, are working with data science, which is, has been really interesting and, and fun to use. You can basically run R, as long as you have R installed on your computer, you can write a bunch of F -sharp scripts and run R from F -sharp. So again, type, we do make heavy, heavy use of the SQL provider, and it, it has been really important. Units of measure also, and the, I don't know if you folks remember this, but there was uh, two of the teams on the, the climate, the, the Mars Climate Orbiter didn't actually communicate with each other well. One was using metric, one was using English, English units, and the entire craft exploded because they didn't communicate this to each other. Whoops. But units of measure don't necessarily just have to be a scientific thing. You know, it doesn't have to all be meters and seconds. They actually, Jet uses them in the, the warehouse code to, to verify, you know, when, when we're stocking products, is this actually a single unit of something? Is an entire pallet of something? You know, just because we say we have one of something doesn't mean we actually understand what that means. We need a unit along with that. So it can be used for, in a lot of cases, to just make sure you, you're really clear on what you're talking about. So F sharp also, I think, personally, is very, very readable. This is you know, one of my favorite examples of F sharp being readable. I'm kidding, that's Perl. <laughs> but it is one of my favorite examples of Perl not being readable. Uh, so Ramon tweeted this uh, a while ago. But he was basically doing a technical talk. He had some F sharp in there. And one of his, came, his friends came along later and was like, you said you were going to have code in that talk. What up, dude? The, this is the actual code he had in his talk. He had his entire domain model there. And it's pretty clear what, and that's what the, was in the actual tweet at the bottom, the picture he had. But it's pretty clear what's actually happening here. You have a discriminated union, the top, a booking, basic, which is just your plane or a combo, or the full pack, you're getting a plane, hotel, and a car. So you're, you're booking a, you know, travel. The, the type and, 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 the, this is a way of defining all of your types at once. You don't have to say type in front of each one. You can just say and, and they're all together. But you know, next we have a plane. The plane needs an outbound and a return, both date, times, and destination. Apparently, you only need a destination country. You don't need to know which city you're flying into. That seems complicated. Um, but there's also a combo. So you're either with the hotel or with a car. It's, it's one kind of combo. The hotel, again, needs an arrival and a departure and a country. Uh, the car, again, needs a from and a to, for how long you're renting it, and the country. Then the country, specifically, is a specific name and an ISO, uh, uh, an ISO code, which is a char, uh, char star char uh, tuple. That's how you define the, show the type for a tuple. So again, that's pretty easy to glance at and actually see what's happening. I have another story. A friend of mine did a very similar thing. After uh, you know, a, a quick meeting, yeah, he jotted down, again, like this, the, the domain model for the, the, what they, the, the new feature that they had just described. And the business analyst who was in the meeting asked him to send around his notes so that the rest of the business analysts on the wider team understood what they were building. He's like, it's not notes. I just actually wrote the domain model. It was F sharp. So very easy to read. And again, as an example of shorter code, uh, which has been one of the, the huge ways that we're handling lots of features, lots of uh, being able to handle a, a, a large amount of functionality in a small thing like a microservice. So this bit of code was an article that came out on Code Project uh, a few months ago, a while ago now, maybe six months. That basically, a somebody had taken a a bad example of C-sharp, and I will show you that code in a second. It, it was pretty awful. It doesn't describe anything. You have no idea what's happening. And had rewrote it to be fully refactored, you know, properly, properly worked out. So you, it was very well, very descriptive, very, you understood exactly what was going on. And the original, so this is the original code. You can see, you know, to class one, you're apparently calculating something. Uh, and the, the original result is zero, but there's, some different types that are involved in some years, but it's really unclear what's actually supposed to be happening here. 
So it was refactored and cleaned up in C Sharp still. And it went from 25 lines of code to 118 lines of code. And they removed the tests. <laughs> and I get, why, 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 what, what is this? And there's also, you know, there's an I loyalty discount calculator and an I account discount calculator factory. And it's just, it's, there's a lot of overhead for just showing off this small bit of code. There was also a second approach. One guy saw this article and was like, that was some awful C sharp. Here's some better C sharp. So he rewrote it into 52 lines of code which is not bad. He also caught an additional error that the original expander didn't, didn't properly catch. But he noted that the factory method uh, and, and strategy patterns were, were totally irrelevant. This is, uh, let's see, Ralph, Ralph Westphal, um, in his blog post, redid this. So this was his bit of code. And you can see it's a, a little easier to read, a lot clearer to, to properly understand. But the F-sharp community, yeah, someone took this and rewrote this into 30 lines of code. And here, it's actually very clear what's actually happening. So the top, we have, we're taking a, a year and just, you know, aliasing that type, it's just an integer. We have a unit of measure as a percent, because what's actually happening is we're taking uh, discount uh, percentages off for customers who are valued. So we have a discriminated union, which is an enum type, uh, or in this case, acting as. Uh, so simple, valuable, and most valuable. And just basically, you know, there's, there's another discriminated union for account status. If the customer is registered and how long they have been registered, or if they're unregistered. And then the customer discount, this is a shorthand way of pattern matching. So we have, you know, our function. And then if it's a single, then they get a 1% or a simple 1% discount. Valuable, they get a 3% discount. You can see how you simply tag the units of measure here and very quickly can just go through and, and see at a glance that this is a percentage and not some other type of integer. So the, the year's discount, you know, when the years are greater than five, you get an actual 5% discount. Otherwise, you multiply that and you get, you know, one, two, three, four percent discount. Uh, but I, I won't continue on with the rest of it. The, it comes down to the, the very end, the, the price, reduce the price by the customer discount first, and then pipe it in, reduce the price by the year's discount next. And again, it, it's very clear, 30 lines of code to see actually what's happening. So the F-sharp way also has a few tests. You can very quickly get a few numbers and, and you know, one, two, three, four, five lines of code also run some tests. So final reason why to consider F-sharp and why, why we chose and why it's, it's so important. Excuse me. You definitely don't need a PhD. And, and F-sharp has this reputation of being, you know, the complicated thing. But this is my friend Sean. And when Sean was eight, he spoke at NDC Oslo, actually, as his first talk, on F-sharp. And it, it was a lightning talk, I believe. But it wasn't just a, a little, like, Here's my Hello World program, and you should clap for me because I'm eight, and that was adorable. And I gave a talk. He actually did some very interesting things using 3D image modeling. So it was, you know, he's eight, and he is very much able to handle this. Obviously, he doesn't have a PhD. <laughs> so now, the guidelines on actually, now that we have all of this background, we can actually get into the proper guidelines. And first, you're going to hate me. Be functional. <laughs> this is why I go and talk about F Sharp so much. That F Sharp and microservices are such an easy, natural fit. Just makes so much sense. The using data in, data out transformations. The beginning I said that it's, it's really important to have, you know, we, we built our, our services as F Sharp scripts, and they have inputs, they have outputs. You know exactly, you, you need to know exactly what that transformation is in the meantime. And, you know, think about what that mapping should be. There's also, you know, start, uh, prefer mutability. The, if you're doing things, you know, if you have inputs and you have outputs and you're looking at that transformation, you will naturally create an immutable general service. And, you know, those two things fit together very naturally, very easy. But avoid state changes and side effects and mutable data as much as you feasibly can. It's really, really hard to do, to do anything, excuse me, uh, concurrent and to scale when you have a lot of mutable data running around and just yeah, mutation makes things difficult. 
treat functions as units of work. Think about passing around a single function rather than you know, passing around an object. And again, if you're making things immutable and you're using these data in, data out transformations, that sort of comes along fairly naturally. The same thing with using recursion. You know, these four things, it, it's difficult to do just one of them. You have to sort of jump in and, and do all of them all at once. Ah, uh, but next, don't try to abstract. Microservices are small for a reason. They're, it, it's very easy to create a single microservice that will connect to event store and a single microservice that will connect to zero MQ. Don't try to mix and match the two. If you try to create one service that handles all of these things, you'll have to cater to the lowest common denominator and it's going to do all of that sort of mediocrely for all services. You're not gonna be able to use the, the unique features of, you know, MSMQ because SQL Server doesn't necessarily have half of that stuff. So they're small. Write a single service for each one. Now, where you can't actually remove side effects because life, you know, they happen, isolate them as best as you can. If you have, say, a submit order microservice where, you know, uh, somebody's just placed an order, they've hit please buy this on the shopping cart, and you need to go and handle all of this now, you might want that to first update SQL Server, and then second, send a thank you for ordering email. Don't do this. <laughs> Because, as I talked about, all of our, all of our service, uh, services are event sourced, we're reading uh, from an event stream, if we go and replay that and rerun you know, that event stream and rehandle all of these microservices, when we do that, we are going to, you know, when we replay everything, we're going to, one, update SQL again, because maybe we've changed the, the SQL schema, something like that, but we're also going to resend all of those emails from all time back out to the customers. That's bad. <laughs> so separate them. Again, microservices should have one purpose, one, one small thing. So set two separate microservices, one that inserts, actually does the insert into SQL, and one that sends the thank you, thank you for ordering email. And then when you need to replay everything, you'll replay the SQL service. You don't need to mess with the, the thank you for ordering email uh, service, and you won't get snafus like that one. Also, use a backup service. So, have two services in production. Uh, you know, service one is running in production, perfectly fine and normal. Backup service is uh, in production, up to date. But if you want to replay all of your events, do so in your backup service. Wait until that one is, is up to speed and is ready to go then you can automatically switch over to that one and have no downtime. Sort of like having a, a staging server, just flip that one on and you're ready to go. The important thing though, is to stage a copy of you know, any aggregate, any data store that you have until the stream is continued replaying. If you're, it's basically to isolate your side effects. Uh, if you're doing something like handling accounts, maybe you're, uh, you have a service that will, will turn off and on accounts because you think they're fraud, whatever. Maybe uh, there are a few customers that argued with, a, with you they weren't actually fraud. You determined that they weren't, and so you turned their accounts back on. Every time you replay those events, if you're doing that against a live database, you're going to be turning those accounts off and then back on again. It might only take you know, 30 seconds. It might take you know, an hour, a day, depending on how much back data you have but you will be turning somebody's account off and then back on again. And if that happens to be at a time where they're trying to purchase something, they're just gonna be really angry at you. And you know, having that, so if you stage that, run through everything, update as needed, and then switch both pieces over to live at once, you'll be much better off. So what do our services actually look like? I mentioned they're actually F-sharp scripts, and they basically look like this. Most importantly, I've talked about how we need to have inputs and outputs and how and F, this, this F-sharp script is sort of like one giant function. This, here we have our, our inputs. We have, as an, so this, <laughs> this service is a, a demo, a uh, little service that I wrote up that connects to some magical Nile website and does a price check on a specific item that's sent in. That's funny. I know it's a terrible, awful joke 
please laugh. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Niall. Um, there's an input, so we have a specific product that we're going to be sending in and saying double check the price on this product. For the outputs, we have two cases, a discriminated union. The first case, we send back the, the full product information plus a decimal for what the price was on the, the external site. We also have a failure case, product price check failed, in which case we have you know, a message, some information about how, what that failure was and how that happened. Next, we define how that input transforms to the output. So again, sort of one giant function. We have inputs, we have outputs, we have a transformation. Uh, we have handle. Here's where the real meat of the microservice really is. It's just a, you know, a, this, is, this is where that transformation happens. I've, you know, as this is a demo, I'm just returning a successful case. I'm automatically creating that. I, I'm using an option type and specifically creating a, a, a uh, valid uh, or a success case for an option, but I have a SKU and an, a my amazing product and uh, a cost per, and then you know it's 3.96 uh, on on the external site. Then once we have how how that transformation happens, we need to define what we're actually going to do with this output. And we have this interpret function, so we're sending in you know the output and ID. And we're doing our pattern matching here. Excuse me. So we match the output with first the successful a successful completion of the successful case, and maybe in this case we want to write to event store, and it's you know just uh, continue on. Yes, we actually were able to get this price. We know exactly what's happening. We connect it out successfully to the API, and and have a value value return. So in the ca next case, we have a successful completion of a failure case. So we got a response back, but we got a failure. So we might want to log that. Maybe it's a failure we know how to deal with. Maybe you know, there's either a timeout or a specific, a specific issue. There was you know, extra space on the end, and we know that we can just truncate it and try again. But in this case, we, we might log and or try again. In the last case, we actually received no response at all, and we have absolutely no idea what happened, but something went terribly wrong. So here again, you know, we have our options. We have you know, the, success, the success cases to begin with, but we have this third option where you know, it, it just you know, it, it completely failed. And here we might log the failure, but we wouldn't have the additional information to know what actually happened. Finally, so we have an, our event store queue.consume, which is one of our internal functions basically takes in a, the, the original product information, decodes that properly, sends the handle and interpret functions along to this consume function, and we're able to consume this stream of events properly for our microservice to be able to handle all of that. So being functional just means that this composition here is very, very easy, and uh, it works together and flows together really nicely. So, Microservices also shouldn't control their own life cycle. It's, we ended up rolling our own product. A lot of folks use Docker or console, but you know, scaling and availability and discoverability, all of these things really should be handled by outside products. Uh, we were able to, uh, we rolled our own, we were able to deploy a new build in about 30 seconds rather than 15 minutes that it had been taking us. We also wanted to, Scaling really should include like a, an entire VM with assorted or relevant related related services um, automatically, rather than uh, just scaling one or two services on their own. So we built a product that handles the top uh, purple things and the the top eight things. We're working on the bottom three things, and probably will open source that when we're done. We so the the product we built is called Torch. At Jet, all of our products are ah, named after superheroes. So this is Torch, who is fire and not a, you know, a, 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 a flashlight. Uh, but e each one of the microservices has an associated YAML file that that helps Torch sort of understand what you know has a few configuring options, what version of Torch it should be using, what that subsystem is, you know, what which things should be scaled all together in, in that VM, 
a name, a description, a version, whether or not to auto start, whether or not to compile. HA stands for high availability, whether or not it's, it's active active or active passive. Active active means that all of their nodes are up at once, and if one of them fails, then the, the traffic that should have gone to that node will just be redistributed over the rest. Uh, active passive means you have two completely separate setups. One is live and the other one is waiting for this, the, the live one to go down. Uh, but it is fully, fully redundant. The, so we have a, a script path and a library path. A few arguments, the, you know, if we want to, to set up a specific JSON config, this is really especially useful for our uh, data science group. They can, part of that JSON config tells, uh, tells them how to transform that data into a specific Kafka topic, and by modifying just a couple lines, they can completely transform how they're looking at that data. So then YAML, I thought, was really fun. I, I double-checked what it actually meant to, to make sure I knew what I was talking about. YAML ain't markup language, so it's a recursive acronym, which is always fun. Those make me happy. But it also used to mean yet another markup language, which is the exact opposite of what it currently means. But it was backronymed, which is a new word I learned, to clarify. So it's, it's not like, you know, uh, GitHub's markup language. It's, you know, data-oriented markup language. Totally different. So, in summary, don't abstract. If you have one service and you want to, you know, you, know, you need to, uh, you know, don't try to have that cater to several, several different things. Microservices are intended to be small, so have a single microservice for each, each specific thing. Be functional. Uh, obviously, I have talked at, at length about F Sharp, but it is, it, it's very important to our story, and the, the two things are so intermingled for us that, that it's almost crucial. We, we wouldn't be able to write microservices as easily as we do if we weren't doing them in a very functional manner. Isolate your side effects as best as you can, um, and you know, where you can't, separate, separate the service, you know, so you have one specific, one specific service that handles just a specific side effect. Use a backup service. Make sure you have something that's you know, chugging along in production. You can replay events into that service and then just switch over as needed and you're ready and good to go. Use the consistent formatting. It's, I showed you what our services look like and that doesn't have to work for you, but it has been very useful to us to have a similar format across teams. Folks can, can jump in and you know, it's very clear what, what pieces of the microservices are meant to do. Use an outside product to control your life cycle. Again, we built our own, but it, you don't have to. Uh, use, but use some sort of outside product. Don't try to handle this all on your own. And then uh, make sure you have a chaos engineering program, because anytime you're doing, especially if it's you know, cloud-based microservices, but anything that, that's going to be this, <laughs> this, this scaled, this, uh, you know, is going to have failures, is going to have uh, issues, you want to make sure you have confidence in that system and you know exactly what's going to happen, and especially with you know, something like us, a, a, a website that you know, folks are dependent on, if something's going to go down, you know, we need to make sure that we're handling this correctly. We can be back up to speed as quickly as possible. So, for more information, definitely uh, check out, for microservices, martinfowler.com, microservices.io, both really good places. For F Sharp, there's a, an F Sharp foundation, uh, fsharp.org. Lots of really, really good information on how to get started. Uh, once you join, and it's free to join the foundation, uh, you can pay if you want, but you don't have to. Once you've joined, you can join the fsharp.org Slack channel. There's, there's a couple other Slack channels. Uh, Twitter is also a really good place to get F Sharp information, but by far my favorite one is the fsharp.org Slack channel. It's a really good group of very responsive people. Also, F Sharp for fun and profit, Scott Vlashen, Scott Flashen's explanations are fabulous and right on point. For event sourcing, honestly, pretty much anything Greg Young has ever spoken about, but these two talks in particular are, are quite good. And that's actually it, but I will leave up this slide if more folks want to take pictures. And any questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the teams use uh, chaos engineering and you got a lear lot of learnings from that. Um, how did they feed back into when you do development of new microservices? 
So do you, do they do you have templates or do you just have a, like sets of standards or? <laughs> so uh, yeah, how does how does the team take take what we've learned from chaos engineering and and sort of bring that in? As far as I know, uh, the the teams don't have any specific standards or or templates. I, I was on a, a team when I first started, and I've switched over to full-time evangelism. So the team that I was on at the beginning did not. But that was also very much before we, the, the chaos uh, program was even in place. But it's my understanding that we don't have anything specific. It's sort of on the individual developers to you know, remember what happened last time. <laughs> All right, thank you guys very much.